my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer, and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place for women to come together to share their childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from women all over the world. I'm so excited to have Laura Dearman on the show today. Laura is going to share three birth stories. Her first one was in the hospital. And her second one was at home, and her third one was at the farm in Summertown, Tennessee, which many of you may know was started by Ina Mae Gaskin, who's pretty much considered the mother of midwifery in the U.S. She's also a really close friend of Elizabeth Quinn, who is a past guest of the birth hour. And you can listen to her birth stories if you go back to episode 16. All right, on to the show with Laura. Hi, Laura. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here today to share your birth stories. Thank you for having me. Let's start off by having you tell us a little bit about you and your family. Okay. My name is Laura Dearman. I was born and raised in Mississippi, and about 18 months ago, we moved to sunny Orlando, Florida, and we love, love, love Florida. So my oldest son is seven, my daughter is five, and my younger son is two and a half. Wonderful. Well, I know we're mostly going to focus on your most recent birth today, but why don't you tell us a little bit about those first three births, where they took place, and how that influenced your last birth? Okay. My um, oldest son, Henry, his birth was a a fairly typical picture of what you see in maternity care in America. I saw an obstetrician who I literally, upon a friend's advice, called the only local clinic in our small town, and I got just the first doctor, the first appointment I could get. You know, we didn't click that well, and luckily some really positive turns of events happened, and at 20 weeks, I switched within the same clinic to a different obstetrician, gynecologist, who was wonderful. He was respectful. He listened. I felt like he cared. He made sure I knew options. He made sure that I knew what was going on. But honestly, I was not at all into birth like I am now. And my plan was to go to the hospital, get some drugs, have my baby, breastfeed, get home and cloth diaper. And that, and that's really how it went. I got to the hospital in active labor. I had stayed all in an epidural, which I slept through the insertion of the epidural because the stay all completely knocked me out. And all I can assume is that I labored down and probably was complete for quite a while before I was lucid enough to push because when I was told it was time to push, it was quick and easy, and I had my baby in my arms, and we breastfed, and we went home, and we cloth diapered, and it really worked out how I wanted to at the time. And then 14 months later, I became pregnant with my daughter, and I thought, or really, I probably didn't think too much about it. I just assumed I'd have the same experience, but in the back of my head, I was thinking about how much I disliked the blood pressure cuff. That was the number one thing that I didn't like from my son's birth. So I didn't like the blood pressure cuff and how my back hurt. And I didn't understand at the time that that was leftover residual pain from the epidural site, but I just knew I wanted to not have my back hurt. And so when I was around 12 weeks pregnant with Liza, a friend of mine who she was pregnant too, and our older children were around the same age, she just kind of randomly asked at the library story time if I was planning to use an epidural. And according to her, I said, oh, yeah. But in my mind, I was like, huh, it's never really occurred to me to think about it or question it. So from that point on, I quickly switched gears and I was like, oh, wait, I don't have to have an epidural. That's not what I want. So I was still seeing my obstetrician and he was super supportive of whatever I wanted to do. He was like, oh, yeah, you know, you can 
have any kind of birth you want at the hospital. And as a doula, I later I saw that that was true about our local hospital, that the nurses and the doctors were supportive. But in the back of my head, I was just like, oh, that's not where I want to be for the birth of my baby. You know, I'd quickly come to realize that pregnancy wasn't a medical emergency. Birth did not require all the bells and whistles and lights. So I started like literally at night, I, I had would have dreams about having a home birth. But where we lived, there's very limited access to midwifery care. And I didn't feel like it was reality, but like I kept having this dream at night. And I told my husband and he was like, well, why don't we do that? I'd love to avoid having to go to the hospital. And so when I was, so it was still just kind of floating around as a dream. And at 35 weeks pregnant with Liza, I ran into an acquaintance at the grocery store and she was in early labor, pushing her buggy around the grocery store. And she had hired a midwife and was going to have a home birth. And so with her in early labor, I sat there and I got the phone number of her midwife. I called the midwife that day. We made an appointment. We drove an hour and a half to see her the next day. We hired her that evening and had a lovely home birth about six weeks later at 41 weeks plus two days. I had, well, really the only way to describe it is that I pushed just out of control. And um, as a friend likes me to say, I tore every which way but loose. And my midwife was not comfortable repairing my extensive perineal tear from side to side, up and down. It was only a second degree, but it just went everywhere. And so we decided to leave our new baby girl at home with my mom. And we um, told the midwife we did not want her to come to the hospital because I wanted it to just be as easy and as seamless as possible. I felt very, very lucky that my personal obstetrician, who I told I was having a home birth and he had been supportive, had told me how his father was born at home with a midwife. And he was the one that happened to be on call that day at the hospital. So we met him. We were at the hospital for about two hours and um, he graciously and politely and kindly talked to me about our birth and had his questions to make sure that I was healthy. He stitched up my uh, tear and we went home and, you know, it, it was great. I felt great after my first natural birth, even though my bottom was sore. I just, I felt good and it just really clicked with me that women's bodies are designed to birth that there's no way we can deny it things don't always go perfect they don't get perfect usually anything in life but that our bodies are finely tuned to birth so after that i I just uh, it became my passion i thought that i would be done reading birth stories but like i was reading more birth stories i was finding people that would just want to talk to me about their experiences and it felt like a fulfillment in my life that i discovered like the power of birth and how it unifies women as one because no matter your experience women give birth one way or the other so about 18 months after my daughter was born i became pregnant for the third time i called my midwife first thing um, told her i was pregnant i knew she's very busy and that we wanted to go ahead and book her i wanted to be in her calendar and then we decided you know we'd have our first prenatal appointment around 10 weeks no no need to rush So I did that, but from the moment I saw the the positive pregnancy test, like I felt like it wasn't going to be the happy, joyful birth. Something inside me just knew. And so I was really hesitant to tell family and friends, unlike with our first two pregnancies, my husband was like, wow, yes, we're pregnant. And he was telling people and he was so excited. And I I told him how I felt that I just had this nagging feeling, but you know, he was like, that's just life. We'll move on. It's going to be perfect. And so right around nine weeks, I started spotting and I started having back pain and I immediately knew I was miscarrying. Like I had known I would from the moment I took the pregnancy test. So I went to see my obstetrician 
at the local women's clinic. He asked me what I wanted to do. I told him I wanted to see if we could find a heartbeat first with the Doppler. And if not, I wanted an ultrasound. We did that. Um, The ultrasound showed growth had stopped at seven weeks. Again, my OB asked me what I wanted to do. And I told him that I just wanted to go home and have a miscarriage. And he talked to me about signs of infection, things that I would want to call him about, emergency situations. And he wished me my best. And he told me to let him know if there was anything he could do to help. So I went home. Um, The next day, I knew that I would miscarry that day. I woke up. It felt like early labor. I sent my kids to a friend's house. My husband went to work. I was alone at our house, which in hindsight seems crazy, but I was alone and that was what I wanted and where I wanted to be. It was really similar. The loss in that birth of our baby was very similar to really my first two births, my first two live births, because it went fast. It was intense. It peaked, I miscarried, and then, you know, it took me several months to emotionally heal. And during those months, I decided I was happy with my two babies that I had, and I didn't need another baby. So I um, sold baby toys. I gave away baby clothes. Like, I purged our house of newborn. So, of course, after I did my purging and emotional reconciliation, I decided we needed another baby. So, um, I became pregnant with Oliver and his due date was the exact same day as my daughter's due date only three years later July 29th and we were hoping to have another August baby as our two older children are both born in August so we wanted August to be our month and it turned out it was we have three August babies you know this all leads to his birth at the farm and As soon as I got pregnant with him, I knew he would be born and it would be perfect. I did not have those doubts like I had with the baby I miscarried, but I had really specific concerns. I had strong feeling, intuition, if you will, that he would be born after short, intense labor. My son's medicated labor was eight hours. My first time birth was five hours, and I knew that this baby would be born quickly. I just knew it, no doubt in my head. So my midwife that I used for my daughter's birth, she lived about an hour and a half from our house, and she covers like pretty much the whole northern half of Mississippi. She's very busy, very, very busy, lots and lots of births. And I just immediately felt like if I hired her, that she wouldn't make it to the birth. She was good. I liked her. I liked her experience. I like her very traditional hands-off ways of midwifery, but I felt like she wasn't the right choice. I looked into other midwives. Everybody was much farther. I was like, well, if I hire a midwife that's four hours away, we will be having an unassisted birth. And I wasn't comfortable with that because during birth, I need that strong female support. And my husband was unequivocally not okay with an assisted birth. So at first I decided, well, you know, we won't have a home birth. We'll just have a hospital birth. It'll be fine. I'll labor at home. I'll walk in the door. I'll push my baby out and then I'll sign us out AMA and we'll come right back home. That was my plan. So around eight weeks, my husband was like, I don't understand why that's the plan. He's like, what have you thought about the farm? It's only four hours away. And we had watched their documentary, The Birth Story, and, you know, he had heard me gushing about Anna Mae and all that she's done for midwifery and the farm midwives for years at this point. And so I looked up the website, I called, I talked to the first midwife that answered the phone, Stacy. By the end of the conversation, I was like, well, where do I send in my deposit check? It just felt right. So we decided to birth at the farm when I was about eight weeks pregnant. I continued to see my OB and he knew of our plans and it kind of changed like the way insurance paid for stuff. So it was a bit of a hassle because we knew that, you know, I would have my prenatal care there at the clinic in my town and then birth at the farm. So I saw him and he was 
perfectly respectful. He had heard about the farm and he had heard the name Ina Mae Gatskin. So, you know, I did a little educating for him. And as always, he was respectful of whatever I wanted to decide for me. The first time we went up to the farm, I was about 15, maybe a little more weeks pregnant. We saw my midwife, Stacy, and her apprentices, Brandis and Laura. And we also met Ina Mae that day. And Ina Mae and Stacy asked if I would come back in a few weeks to do an interview with CBS about why I chose to travel to the farm. So the next time I went to the farm, I met with Ina Mae and did an interview with CBS Sunday morning show. And then we didn't go back to the farm again until I was 39 weeks. We decided 39 weeks was safe because both babies had been born after their due date. And, you know, I thought I'd get to the farm have my baby the next day, be home a few days later. Well, it turned out we were there for three weeks, just like his big sister with her due date of July 29th. She was born on August 7th, and our little baby Oliver with his due date of July 29th, he was also born on August 7th. So she celebrated her third birthday the day he was born. You know, once we had the place of birth settled, in the back of my head, I had this concern about back labor. I was worried about back labor, and I was worried about having a baby with a tongue-tied lip tie, both of which turned out to be very legitimate concerns. I um, woke up in labor on August 7th. It was a restful night of sleep the night before, up and down to the bathroom, And I woke up, I knew it was labor, the exact same as it had been with my two earlier births. And I laid on the couch, I tried to rest, I was being my doula to myself, saying, oh, I needed to rest, I need to eat. I got up, I started walking around the cabin where we were staying, feeling so safe because a midwife with 30 years experience was in the house We were staying in her basement apartment, so she was upstairs asleep, and I knew that there were at least six other midwives within a mile, so it made me feel so good and safe to know that that our baby would be born exactly where he needed to be. So I walked around. I woke up my husband when I knew it was labor. I called my midwife. As soon as I called, she answered with, is this labor? And I said, yes. She said, I'm on my way. I'll be there as soon as I can. Wake up Sharon if you need her. So we felt beautifully taken care of. I told my husband that I wanted him to straighten up the apartment and do the dishes while I was in early labor. So he was doing that. He was doing just what he needed to do. He cooked me an egg, which somehow I made myself eat an egg and a piece of toast to give myself energy. And it, and, it, and it felt right. Like it felt like I was the right, I was in the right place. I felt safe, but my back hurt. It was back labor. I knew it would be, and it was. Baby had been in a oddly, not quite posterior, but not any typical position earlier that week. So I kind of had it in my head anyway, that this might not be a straightforward birth like I was used to, but I just decided to roll with it. And the next thing I knew, I was on my stomach with my butt in the air in the polar bear position, just moaning as loud and as low as I could. And I stayed there in my mind. It feels like forever. At this point, my midwife was there, her two apprentices and the midwife Sharon from upstairs. So there were four women. And I just laid there with my butt in the air and my belly on the ground, just moaning. And I woke up my son. He was four. He would turn five um, later that month. And he came out and he was so excited. And he said, Mama, Mama, you can do this. You did it with Liza. You did it with me. You can do this. And I remember feeling like so blessed that he wasn't scared and, and he, he understood and he felt good. But, but then the other half of me was like, oh my gosh, make him be quiet. Like I can't concentrate with, with his precious words going on. So I said something, they brought him over to the side and he sat there and watched the rest of my labor. 
And so I was still in my mind, like I said, I was in the polar bear position and my butt up in the air for a long time, which now I understand it's my body put me down there because he, he was not properly aligned to go through my pelvis. It was definite, definite posterior back labor. And then at some point, one of the midwives suggested I get up and I was like, no, no, I can't get up. And so they checked the purple line on my butt and said I was probably about seven centimeters and I refused a vaginal exam. And then they were like, you know, why don't we get up seven centimeters? We'll see if you stand up, you know, maybe the gravity will help the baby come down a little faster. So I stood up and I, I we were swaying and I, I just I have this visual memory of me holding on to my husband's neck and just surrounded by the four women. And it was the energy that I needed. I started seeing, oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. This really hurts, which it really, really hurt. The back labor was no joke. It really hurt. And then, so my husband, you know, third birth, he's no, he knows what to say. If I start saying I can't do it, he's like, you are doing it. You can do this. You're doing it right now. So he just automatically at that point became a fabulous cheerleader. And then the playlist that we had been working on for months, we had added songs. It was like a 10 hour long playlist by this point. One of my very favorite Bob Dylan songs came on and he was like, Laura, do you hear your song? This is your song. And it was at that point I was like, okay, I can do this. I can get it together and I can push this baby out. So we stood there for a while. And then right as I started feeling like I was ready to push, I um, felt really dizzy. And I had that same experience with my daughter's birth where I felt dizzy and lightheaded when I needed to push. So I told my midwife how I felt and I told her that that had happened at my daughter's birth. So she guided me and we walked to the um, bathroom. So I said I wanted to sit. So I was sitting on the toilet. Then I was like, no, I'm not going to sit on the toilet. No, no, no. This is not working. I need to lay down. So I didn't know if I was about to push or if I was going to pass out. I really didn't know like what exactly was going on with me, but I felt safe. I knew that I was where I needed to be and that I had midwives who had dealt with every complication and possibility under the sun. So my midwife, Stacy helped me walk to the couch and Sharon, another midwife, she said, you know, that's the waddle of a mother with a baby between her legs. And I looked down and I was like waddling with my legs really open. And at that point, I was like, okay, this is almost over. I can finish this. So we went to the couch and I laid down on my back. And as soon as I lay down on my back, I was like, what? I said this out loud. What am I doing? I don't want to lay on my back. And my midwife was like, well, if you want to lay on your back, she said, lay on your back. That's fine. So she's like, just listen to whatever you want to do. The doula in my brain was going crazy being like, Laura, don't lay on your back. What are you doing? So I kind of shifted over to my left hip and I raised my right leg and a midwife immediately grabbed it to help support. And in my head, I thought, well, this is much better than on my back. I'm on my side. My leg is up. This will be good for a really slow, easy pushing so I don't tear, which was a huge goal was not to tear. So for my entire pregnancy, I had visualized and breathed through seeing in my head the baby's head coming down and and, and opening up through the birth canal and then being born without any damage to my perineum. Like I visualized it for months and, and meditated on it. And just, I was, I mean, I was kind of obsessed with it. The fact that I could control it so I wouldn't tear again like I had before. So we were laying, I was laying there on the couch. My husband, I think he was by my head. My kids were in one of the apprentices' lap down at the end of the couch. She was holding the flashlight, so I know that they had a perfect view of their baby being born. I remember thinking, like, this is it. This is why we're here. I can do this. This is it. And I breathed. And when I when I could feel him crown, I panted for as long as I could. 
and then I pushed and he was born and you know with my daughter I'd felt so amazing and I still felt terrible even after he was born I was so upset my back still hurt even though he was no longer pushing on my sacrum my back still hurt my I just felt bruised all over I felt like I had been in a fight or run over by a truck but I really didn't even notice the slimy little baby on my chest because I was so relieved to be done with that but still like recovering from three and a half hours of intense back labor so like it took me a little bit which I guess was my birth pause I I took that pause I I knew he was there but I I didn't focus on him at all and it took me a, a few minutes to gather myself and then then I saw him and his slimy little self and his plates were a little bit out of whack which who knows why but he he looked kind of funny but he was so cute and he was so sweet and and then we tried to nurse and he was not a good nurser so that took a lot of energy on my part and I had very little to give by that time but we got it together and we stayed in bed for the next three days and nursed 100 percent of the time and um and then about four days later, we, we left the farm, which was emotional because we all wanted to be home, but it's such a special, special place. And so many special things have happened there that a part of us didn't want to leave. But, but we drove our four hours home with our new baby and our two toddlers, and then um, life marched on. Wow. And what was recovery like after getting back home? It was really hard. For about three weeks, I felt terrible. With the back labor, like my husband was rubbing on my back doing the counter pressure, but like he and I didn't think that he needed like oil on his hand. So before like it clicked with us and the midwives, he had rubbed this raw spot on my back Mm -hmm. before we thought to get olive oil on his hand to make it easier for the counter pressure. So that hurt and um, I did tear, but it was a tiny little tear. My midwife went back and forth about um, repairing it, but, but we decided that I I did want her to stitch it up. So I only had about five stitches. So that hurt, but not terribly, but I just, it was hard. I don't know if I was older, which I was. Or having a a few kids at home already. Yeah, exactly. And more tired, but it, it was hard. And we had a lot of problems breastfeeding, a lot of problems, which turned out to be a lip tie, which was one of my fears during pregnancy so it all came full circle yeah it sounds like your intuition is dead on every time yes well what resources do you recommend to pregnant or new mothers based on your experiences I think the most important thing that uh, a woman can consider when she's pregnant is her provider and her place of birth lovely respectful births happen at the hospital but it doesn't mean that the hospital is a one fit solution for all women. You know, if you're lucky to live in a place like I am now living in Florida with birth centers, licensed midwives and different hospitals, you know, don't don't just don't just go to the place that your friend went to or where you were born. You really have to work to find what works for you. And before you can make a choice for your birth, you have to soul search and and learn about birth and and really consider the big picture that's at hand. Yeah, it's so true. What final message would you like to leave with our listeners today? Birth is beautiful. It doesn't matter how your baby comes out. Your baby's always born and, and every birth has something beautiful to it. Thank you so much, Laura, for taking the time today to share your birth stories with me. Well, thank you. It was fun. Thanks again, Laura. If you want to connect with Laura, you can head to thebirthhour.com and leave her a comment on her show notes page. Laura also wrote a blog post about the history of the farm and a little bit about midwifery care in the United States and what led her to the decision to give birth at the farm. So I encourage you to check that out on thebirthhour.com as well. Next week, we will have 
a gestational carrier birth story. I was able to interview both the carrier and the intended mother at the same time. And it was a really amazing episode. I can't wait to share it with all of you. In the meantime, you can connect with me on Instagram at The Birth Hour. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com to sign up for our newsletter. And if you really like the show, please subscribe and leave a review in iTunes. I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer, and you've been listening to another episode of The Birth Hour. Thanks again, and see you next week.